when we started doing these things, I didn't get an, an annoying American voice that popped up and said, this meeting is being recorded, but I do now. Zoom has obviously updated its policies. Good evening, people of Norfolk and the UK and indeed the world. I'm stalling a little bit while numbers build up, but a very good evening to everybody joining us. And a special good evening to you, Mike Dilger. How the devil are you? Very well indeed, Mr. Aitchison. I'm like Mr. Magoo. I've lost my very focal, so I've gone to Boots and bought a pair of cheapies. So I might be just doing a little bit of this, but I am extremely well. I'm yeah. in Kent, I'm a long way from home, and I'm looking out over the sea, staying at a friend's house, and all is well. This is excellent. If I may say so, you're carrying off the glasses with considerable aplomb. And so, but Boots' finest look magnificent on you. You're looking chiselled and um, outdoorsy and thoroughly, thoroughly well. And we'll get on to that. We'll get on to that. So we have, we are delighted to say, Mr. Mike Dilger with us in the house this evening. But to everyone who's joining us from across Norfolk and the UK, a very, very good evening to you all. Now, as always, I have a few bits of housekeeping to do before we get to the interesting bit with Mike. Uh, welcome to Cly Calling. As you know, we're in the middle of our Cly Calling Closer to Home Festival at the moment. And if you haven't heard about that and you've come via Mike's Twitter, for example, then do check it out, please, at clycalling.com. Com. That's clycalling, all one word, dot com. And there you will find information about all of the events that are taking place this week. Some of them real, actual events at Cly Marshes. Who'd have thought it? And some of them are virtual events. And I'll be doing another one on Saturday evening, hosting a panel event. And we're very, very grateful that our Cly Calling Closer to Home Festival is sponsored by Norfolk Cottages. So thank you very, very much to Norfolk Cottages. There are, of course, other events coming up in the near future. We have two events in August. On the 5th of August, I'll be interviewing in person at Climb Arches, the wonderful James Lowen, Norfolk naturalist, celebrated for his many excellent books, but he's just brought out a, a partly autobiographical book um, called Much Ado About Mothing, in which he charts his obsession with moths and tearing around looking for moths. And that will be taking place at Climb Marshes. And then on the 19th, our friend Steve Rutt has just brought out his third book called The Eternal Season, which charts uh, his relationship with summer and summer wildlife, but also looks into the theme of our changing environment and climate change. So both of those are very much to look forward to. And very soon, details of those will be also on the website, clycalling.com. Now, as you know, this is a free event and everybody is welcome. We're delighted to see you all. However, if any of you are closet millionaires and would like to leave vast amounts of money to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we're terribly nice. Stop it, Dil, just stop it at once. We'll, but we can block you, you know. Um, if any of you would like to leave us um, millions of pounds, David is going to pop a link through which you can generously make a donation. Thank you very much indeed. Final thing before we get to the interesting bit. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question to Mike, you have a chat at the bottom of the screen. Please, uh, no, sorry, not in the chat. You can't put stuff in the chat, please. There should be a Q&A, which is bottom right of your screen on my computer. You can pop your questions into the Q&A. Some of them I will read to Mike and some of them we will attempt to. The, the less libelous ones will bring you into the conversation so that you can ask Mike directly. But back to you, Mr. Dilger. Now, just when we were talking in our green room a moment ago, you said, talk, staying with the theme of green, you said the house you're in was lived in by Graham Green. Indeed. Um, I'm just in for one night. And I'm staying with a chap called Richard Teller Jones, who's a, a producer cameraman who also does stuff on screen for Country File and The One Show. And he was my old director back in the day when I was doing nature's calendar and hands on nature prior to my one prior to a gig getting the one show and um, he bought this uh, old ramshackle house that looks out over the sea in deal in east kent and graham green used to live here and there's a funny little balcony nick in the house and graham green wrote a story called a little short story called the balcony about this weird balcony in richard's house so i've been in graham green's balcony prior to chatting to you. I mean, wildlife and culture. I and, do both. 
who could beat it? How could you spend a Thursday evening in any more exciting way, Mike Dilja? Now, I hope, because we're going to come to the fact that you're writing a book much later in our conversation, another, yet another book in your illustrious career, but I hope that you're being inspired by the, the ghost of Graham Greene and you're going to be channeling his creative genius in your book. Well, I am a not so quiet British person. I, I will be channeling my, my kind of inner, I'll be sculpting every word the, the, the book will be all my own words, some in the right order. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge writing. Uh, it's a challenge I enjoy. Um, I'm a much better natural editor. So once I've struggled getting all the words down, finally honing, crafting them and changing them, I really love that bit, but bloody hell writing is difficult. <laughs> it is really. But I mean, no, it's, I embrace a challenge. So yeah, looking forward to writing it this winter. You certainly do embrace the challenge. And let's begin by talking about the, the thing for which you are inherently best known because TV makes people well known. You mentioned a moment ago. Now, before I ask that question, I have a suspicion that the friend you're staying with, having just heard his name, I think he was tweeting about a filthy twitch to Bempton to film an albatross this week, wasn't he? I think he was. He also films for, for The One Show as well. He was, he was going up filming a couple of guys for The One Show as well. So he does this behind the camera and in front of the camera. Uh -huh. And he's, he's very well known, slightly less well known than me. But, well, um, we all bask in your show. Much, much more hidden talents than me. I mean, if you kind of, if you kind of if slightly tired of conversation after 30 minutes, I'm sure we could draft him in and he'll easily fill the rest of the 30 minutes. We all bask in your shade. We are all less well known than you, my daughter. Um, but talking about becoming um, a one show presenter, you strike me as the sort of person who's a naturalist first, a conservationist first, and that presenting is something that sort of happened. So how was it that you came to be the darling naturalist of the nation? Uh, well, I think that's probably slightly over it, but th thank you for that phenomenal build-up, Nick. Um, you know, TV is very much a second career, actually, and I would say I'm a naturalist first and a TV presenter second. Um, and what sustained me in a career of television presenting is knowing quite a lot about natural history. I am absolutely obsessed by wildlife. I have been for 40 years. Um, I got into wildlife at a, a pretty early age. My parents bought me this book called Bruce Campbell's Guide to Birds in Colour, 256 different British birds. And I, I got that for my ninth birthday and I, I, you know, I persuaded my parents to buy me a pair of binoculars um, a, a month later. And that was it, I set me off on the path of righteousness. And it was all birds first and foremost, and I'm a generalist naturalist now. So, I mean, it was wildlife for a long time. I only got into television in my early mid thirties. Um, and people associate me being a British presenter because I've spent a lot of time on work on Inside Out, Naturalist Calendar, uh, um, Hands on Nature, and obviously the one show. But a lot of my wildlife expertise comes from abroad. I spent about five years working in the tropics. So I spent um, six months working in Ecuador. Then I came back, got a job uh, as a life model. So I was a naturalist, so I thought I'd become a naturist as well. Raising money, taking my clothes off for a living, standing there naked. And then I, worked to, um, I went to Vietnam for a year and a half, came back, took my clothes off, uh, went to Tanzania for a year and a half. Going to tropical forests, doing survey work in, in, in tropical forests, identifying birds, bees, butterflies, all that kind of stuff, doing biological survey work in the forest. And then I went back to Ecuador. I thought, well, I've done the new world, I've done Asia, and I've done um, the old world, Africa. Where was my favorite place? And it was Ecuador, of course. I worked in the cloud forests of Ecuador. So people think of Ecuador, this funny little country that sits right on the equator. And it's one of the most biologically diverse countries on the planet because not only does it have a chunk of the Amazon rainforest, it straddles the big letter M that is the Andes. So if you're, if you, there's the Pacific Ocean here and the Andes is this chain of mountains, the backbone running throughout South America. So if you're a rain droplet coming in on the prevailing uh, westerners, hitting west coast of South America, then you hit the Andes and start to rise. Hey, there's, there's one of my hosts, this is Finbar. How are you doing? Oh, well, I'm just doing a Zoom, so I'll see you in an hour. I'll see you in an hour. Okay, cheers, Finbar. So my, my, my host's um, son has just arrived back from his skateboarding session. So uh, if I'm a raindrop and I hit the, hit the mountains, I get forced up and then I condense and with all the other raindrops and I form these big clouds in these cloud forests. So 
It's forest at altitude on the western slopes of the Andes, where it's the, it's the epicenter for orchids, bromeliads, hummingbirds. So all these bird, all these plants, these epiphytes, plants that live on plants, sitting up in the cloud forest with where the light is and where the clouds are. So I was working out in the cloud forest of Ecuador and Channel 5 were making a series called Eco Warriors, all about Brits in the back of beyond, 10 minute films for Channel 5. And I'd never been on television before. So it was before email back in the mid late nineties and that this company said, can we come and interview you about your, your job as a wildlife biologist in the cloud forest of Ecuador? And I said, sure. So uh, three guys came out, there's a, there's a cameraman sitting there with a camera on his shoulder, looking all gnarly, filming various, uh, saying things like, oh, glorious close-ups and wonderful GVs and beautiful lights. And he's attached by a long, long umbilical cord to a, a sound recordist who's recording the sounds of the rainforest. So he's going, oh, cliff sound, beautiful wild track, using all this terminology I'd not heard before in it. And then there's a director, the third member of this trio, and he just kind of minces around and film that and film that. So we went, they, I met up with them and I took them around the reserve for a couple of days and we filmed beautiful shots of the rainforest, the orchids, the bromeliads, a few hummingbirds. We managed to get a few nice birds filmed. And the time came to interview me about my job. So Cameron was there, ready to film me and the sound recorders were ready to record me. And the, the director, Rob, said to me, Mike, it's obvious you're keen on birds. I said, I like my birds. Yeah, yeah, I like birds a lot. So he said, when <coughs> I get the camera to turn over, the tape to turn over, and when you're clear for sound, and when I say action, could you talk enthusiastically about some of the birds? And I said, yeah, okay. He said, could you maybe do an impersonation of one or two of the birds? I said, well, I'll give it a go. She said, okay, clear for sound, um, camera ready, turn over, uh, and action. I said, there's an amazing bird here called the Andean cock of the rock. It's a lecking species. So every day, dawn and dusk, they come to the same ancestral lecking tree. The males are bright fuchsia pink all over, with a huge crest, black and silver wings, and the females are dull, boring, and dowdy. But as we all know, the females rule the roost. So the males will turn up, and all of a sudden they notice a female is in the next tree to them, 10 or 15 of them in there, and, and their specific branch they hang out on. The crest goes up, they start flapping these black and silver wings, and they go, <laughs> and the females are looking across, the males are looking, saying, look, pick me, pick me, and the female flies off, going, whatever, and the males are just oh, downhearted, crest drops. Then another female turns up. So I did this impersonation, and the director was like, anymore. And I said, oh yeah, there's a beautiful bird called the Toucan Barbit. It's unlike the, the Andean cock of the rock, the male and female look the same. And it's like this bird has been designed by the great evolutionary painter. It's got a berry on, it's got an outline of a bird and black, uh, black cap, uh, ivory colored bill with a black tip, vermilion throat, going to orange on the breast, going to lemon on the belly. It's got uh, olive green wings. It's got a blue rump and a slate black tail. I mean, the ornithological technical term is a bobby dazzler. And they do this thing called an antifernal duet. So they stand next to each other on a branch and the male nods to the female and the female nods to the male. And the male goes, ah, and the female goes, ah. And they do this jump up and down. They get, start slowly and go faster and faster. It goes, ah, 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 so I did an impersonation of these two birds and he said, have you ever thought of a career in television? And I hadn't up, up to that point. Then I thought, well, I got so ill because one of my nicknames is Britain's most diseased man because I've had malaria, bilharzia, leishmaniasis, sepsemia, ringworm, roundworm, filariasis, pot flies, jiggers, tropical yaws. I mean, I've almost died a couple of times from all these weird diseases, but I was really homesick. I was skint because as we all know, Nick, there's no money in conservation. Uh, so I decided to move down to Bristol and try and get a job in TV, and, and, and that's how it happened, really. Goodness me, goodness me, what a story. I don't think we've ever had the conversation. It's not one for now, but the fact that I lived in South America for a long time as well, and have had... Hablas Espanol también. Claro que sí. 
Claro que sí, pero yo viví en Bolivia. Um, no. But this is, this is a conversation for another time, Michael. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, over a beer sometime, we'll talk about South America. Um, in your illustrious career, having made it to the one show, you don't obviously get to talk a lot about Toucan Barbets and um, Andy and Cock of the Rocks, Cox of the Rock, because we don't have a lot of them around here. And most of what you were doing was, was British wildlife. Do you, do you have any particular, I suppose, let's start with, with moving stories, stories about wildlife, the, the things that have really excited you the most, the things that you've, you've, you've cared about and maybe got involved in the projects as a result of being said, go, go film this, Michael, things that have changed your way of seeing things. Uh, I am very lucky, uh, I'm, you know, uh, people say I'm lucky to do what I do, and, and I, I am lucky, but you know, like you, Nick, you know, you, the harder you work, the luckier you become. And I, I reckon that David Attenborough is probably the world's most travelled man. That's hardly anywhere else can be. But I've probably been to more places in Britain than David Attenborough has. I mean, because the one show, I've done 450 films with one show, so I've travelled all over the British Isles. I was very lucky to go out right out past St Kilda to go and look for big cetaceans a few years ago in a one show. And we sailed past the western side of the out uh, Hebrides, the, the uh, Western Isles. And we went past Bower, Benbecula, South Uris, North Uris, Harris, Lewis, Sulitzker, the Shants, the Monarchs, St Kilda. I've done a lot. And I, Britain is love, it's amazing. I mean, I, I, I travelled all around the world and saw this amazing wildlife. And I kind of moved back to Britain, started working on a series with Bill Oddie, and then Spring Watch before the one show came my way. And I suddenly fell back in love with British wildlife. I mean, we are terribly, terribly lucky to live in these amazing islands i mean i love the seasons it's not the most biodiverse place it's probably there's more naturalists in britain than anywhere i mean our wildlife is better known than anywhere else so i've kind of fallen back in love with with british wildlife working on the one show so i mean i mean every film i do i just throw my heart and soul into so if someone says do you want to go and film humpback whales off the west coast of ireland i go yes please if someone says to me do you want to go and film slugs in the back garden in Bristol, I go, yes, please. Because there's always something to learn. One of the best things about my job is not necessarily just filming the wildlife, it's hanging out with an expert on slugs or an expert on humpback whales, because they're excited about being on television. They're excited about talking about their passionate animal, their passionate plant, or an area or habitat they're passionate about. And I just love talking about them. So, I mean, the conversation is boiled down to five minutes on the one show. But I get the chance to speak to the world expert on slugs for eight hours, and I literally suck them dry for all that information. So when the camera stopped rolling, I, we're still chatting away enthusiastically. So one of the best things actually is hanging around with like-minded souls. That's why when we chat, we kind of talk about wildlife, or why we talk for, we talk about cuckoos you've seen, or or I mean, we, we just we're full of talk of wildlife. I mean, it's I, I could talk about it all day long, and I do talk about it all day long. So, I mean, trying to pick kind of films that I've been most passionate about is really difficult because I've done, usually the best film I've done is the most recent one. I was on the one show last night with my son, uh, tree climbing in the Forest of Dean, and that was, that was wonderful. But in terms of most memorable films, um, it, it is something mega. Um, the one show said to me, do you want to go up to um, the, the, well, the, the Minch between the Inner and Outer Hebrides to go and look for orcas, killer whales? And normally they're quite risk averse because, I mean, at one end you've got the blue chip, David Attenborough stuff where the television filming is very expensive. And I'm the kind of cheap, cheerful budget end where the programmes are quite cheap to make and they don't like to make too many risks, but they want brilliant films. And I'm trying to encourage them to say, if you want brilliant stuff, you have to take a punt every now and again and go for it and, and sort of take a risk. So we went up there to try and film Orcas, which had been seen, and we sailed around for two days and the producers are getting very nervous because we've got nothing at all. And then the waters went still. I mean, it was like, it was like mercury. And then we got a call saying, we've found Orcus off run. Uh, so we dashed down, we were about 50 miles away and we caught up with this pod, the West Coast community of Orcus. Um, and we were filming them and it was just like mercury and the big dorsal fins were coming up. And then I noticed a harbour porpoise in the middle. And I thought, what's the harbour porpoise doing? And this harbour porpoise surfaced and this orca came in and went, it was drowning. 
I was watching them kill. We were watching them kill harbour porpoises. And obviously didn't see them. We think they killed two. Um, and then what happened was we were in a boat and this massive piece of meat floated up to the surface. And you can't see it on the camera. It was about five metres off the boat. And um, it was a harbour porpoise without a head. And we'd work, we were filming with researchers who studied this rescue community, never seen them killing at all. Perfect, it was like pulling a one armed bandit, three cherries, calm water, amazing animal, incredible behavior. And this killer whale came in and it just grabbed this piece of meat and dragged it down. And so the cameraman is here, I'm standing next to him, it's five meters in front of him, the cameraman's filming this killer whale come in. It's like that jaw sequence, I think we need a bigger boat. And it grabbed this piece of meat and then dragged it down to the depths. And the cameraman filmed it and then turned to me. And I was like, oh, crack the mark. That's the only thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I just saw its teeth. And, uh, and I just kind of waffling about this remarkable thing. I mean, I have a bit of a problem with presenters using superlatives because quite often, if they don't really know what they're talking about, they go, amazing, brilliant, superb. I mean, it's like if you don't know knots, tie lots. So, I mean, give us some content, but that was an occasion for superlatives because it was the most amazing thing. So I still think that is the most remarkable thing I've ever seen in my entire life as, as well as films. So, I mean, so many amazing films. Uh, I, I'm just grateful for having had the opportunity, but that really does stand out as being an astonishing film. What a privilege, what a joy, and what as you joy. say, what a lovely way to be that you're grateful for the things you get to do but then come the start of 2020 the whole world went a bit bonkers and this of yeah. course had a massive effect on your life your home life your your life in the context of your family your son everything like that and you became combined to barracks initially to your your garden um tell us about how you homeschooled and what adventures you went on on a tiny scale, a very, very local scale in your own garden with Zachary? Uh, it, it was very difficult, COVID. I'm not, I'm, I'm, people assume I'm a kind of millionaire BBC presenter. I'm not Anton Deck. I am paid on the day I work. And if the phone's ringing a lot, then I earn half decent money. But frequently it's not. And I'm gently rocking, waiting for the phone to ring. So the phone stopped ringing. And I was a limited company, um, so I received precisely this. Uh, the first time I got any money from the government was eat out to spread it about. Uh, <laughs> I won't get too political. No, um, that's not. That's not lovely weather we're having. Uh, we're well, indeed a lo lovely view of uh, France. So anyway, um, it was it was a difficult, stressful time. I mean, families were a bit more difficult. The families have lost loved ones. Um, I had my health, and my family was healthy. Uh, my wife could still work a little bit, so it was difficult. But then I kind of thought, well, we've got a tiny bit of savings and I'll, there's a little bit of work coming in here and there. Uh, we'll just try to enjoy it if we possibly can. And the one blessing was when it was hardcore lockdown last March, April and May, the weather was amazing. So what we did, Nick, was I live in a nice part of the world, in the Chew Valley, south of Bristol. I live near Chew Valley Reservoir. I know all the birds. I know all the peeps they make, kind of the songs, the contact calls. So I started to get into, on my walk with my dog and my son, I started to look at the plants properly. And I have a degree in botany, but I don't know all the plants. Um, so I, I saw a speedwell and thought, that's a speedwell. And I saw a forget-me-not, I thought, that's a forget-me-not. So I thought, I'll take my book with me and I'll actually properly identify which one it is. And I so got into it. And I was just kind of wandering around, stopping all the time, identifying, ah, this is Veronica Persica. This is... My Asotis um, Serpinifolia. And I suddenly got into the joy of botany. And I, I just found myself spreading my wings further and further afield and identifying all these wonderful, getting to groups with hypericums, getting to groups with all these kind of groups that I've shied away from, got into umbellifers. And it was joyous. And it's the first time I've kind of really, since I left university, properly been on this learning curve. And rather than watching television in the evening, I would sit and, and, and sit and look at the BSBI book on sedges. I freaking love sedges. Give me an utricle any day. I love utricles. I love glooms, orms, oh, milky, milky. I absolutely love sedges. 
and I've just massively got into it. Um, I won't go seedy here, but I was having a shower one day, and that's where I do my best thinking while I'm in the shower. And I was thinking about book titles, and I thought, why don't I, there's this book called Fifty Shades of Grey. Why don't I do A Thousand Shades of Green? So I thought, in a whole calendar year, I'll try and see a thousand different British plants, not just flowers, because that's really, really difficult. So I'm on about 750, trying to see, I've seen some stellar rarities uh, and some really, really common things, some ones that just grow out of the weeds in London, um, out of the pavements in London. I mean, anything, I mean, I'll take anything, stellar rarities, and naturalised weeds, um, and it's just been joyous. I've, I've been on a massive learning curve, and that's why I'm down in Kent at the moment. I was at Ranscombe Farm today with an amazing guy called Richard Moyes, wandering around, identifying rough poppy and prickly poppy and ground pine, which smells of pine. It's beautiful. First time I've ever seen it. Um, and then I'm going with my friend Richard to go and look for some broom rakes tomorrow, some rare broom rakes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, and then I'm going up to Scotland to go and look for lots of Scottish stuff. So, so the whole uh, this whole year has been handed over to botany, and I, it's been it's been joyous. I've just I've just found the joy of botany from the darkest darkest of times. It's, well, what a wonderful um, thing! What a wonderful yeah, it's been great. I walked back from the gym one day earlier this week, and on my walk back, I saw 143 species of British flora. Um, along Boom. The yeah, and just amuse my little mind doing that. So I do just the same. I, I amuse myself with weeds, because, and they're just my own private language, really. Just I love weeds, Nick. I, I totally dig weeds. I, I almost got beaten up and thrown out of a building site for, for, um, for breaking in, slightly breaking in, to see Tussilago Farfara, a colt's foot, early in the year. And this big burly guy threatened to beat me up. I, oh, I, it's, it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Part Excellent. of me is shitting myself, sorry. Oops. Part of me is very, very worried, I beg your pardon, thinking I'm going to get beaten. And the other part is thinking, this is going to be make a great story in the chapter. I do apologize if I used a, um, a, a weird word there. We'll, we'll come back to the book, but um, during that time that you were, presumably you were homeschooling Zachary, mm. uh, the process of learning alongside a young person is very much learning from a young person's appreciation yeah. of the world. So what did Zachary teach you? And for that matter, your dog, your lovely Border Collie. Um, what did they teach you about the natural world and your environment and your garden, your own patch, your, your relationship with nature? Uh, the great thing about having a child is and fatherhood came to me very late. I was 47 when I had Zachary. Um, so I thought I'd missed the boat and I, I, I consider myself truly blessed to have him because I mean, it is flipping hard work being a parent, particularly an old parent, but it's, it's a rebirthing process, Nick. It's like, oh, first time on a boat, first time seeing seals, first time on a train, which is the Chroma Sheringham train, a steam train that I took Zachary on, you probably know very well, because my friend Nigel Redman lives in Bristol, who's our guide father. You probably know Nigel very well. He's a, need a prominent Norfolk birder. Yeah, he's, he's, he's Zachary's guide father, so he's a guide parent. Um, so I, I, all, I mean, it's, a, it's just a joy seeing through things through his eyes. But the thing I've found is that they've just got this fresh, naive, beautiful attitude towards everything, and everything's exciting. Plus also as well, he's got brilliant visual acuity. He's closer to the ground, but also his eyes are way better than I'm not Mr. Magoo. His eyes are so much sharper than mine. He always finds the really interesting bugs, the rare plants, so it's joyous. Um, and wildlife is such an easy start to kids. I mean, all his books when he was a kid, Elmer the Elephant, The Gruffalo, they were all inspired by a love of wildlife. And the analogy I have is, my, both my parents were teachers. Um, we used to have Radio 4 in every room in the house. Oh my God, I couldn't even go for a toilet in peace. Um, and I used to hate Radio 4 when it got to my adolescence. What do I listen to now? Radio 4, because they inculcated it at an early age. And it's the same with, with wildlife, he loves it. And he may well kind of go against it, but I think it will come back. And I'm not being immodest because he's got he's got a teacher who's really enthusiastic. And you know, the most important thing is getting kids out and appreciating wildlife because Chris Packham's right when he says the rarest thing you'll see in the countryside is a kid interested in wildlife. I mean, kid, kid, wildlife has to compete with with social media and and video games. Oh my God, video games. Take them outside and show them, get them to climb a tree. 
get him to go and run around and catch a grasshopper in a jar because that kicks ass with anything. So I mean, it's such an easy sell. And so what I made sure, what the one important thing I did was that we'd only do it in bite-sized chunks. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and turn her overdrive with the wildlife because that would really turn him off. So we do it in bite-sized chunks. And when he starts to kind of wane, then we'll go and we'll, we'll go and do something else, something fun, like climb a tree or, or mess about or go and have a coffee or, or hot chocolate or whatever. And um, I think if there's an eight-year-old who knows more plants in the British Isles, then I would like to meet him because he can identify 60 or 70 plants. Astonishing. They go, that's tufted vetch, that's bush vetch. Um, that's uh, that's that's lesser celandine. That was greater celandine, but that's not a celandine. It's actually a member of the poppy family. I mean, his knowledge—he just soaks it up like a sponge. His knowledge is astonishing. But um, I just hope he keeps it. If he if he ever turned around and said to me, "I just wildlife is boring, Dad," I'd, I'd just probably do a swan dive off the cliff and suspension bridge. I'd be gutted. I My friend Stephen Moss, um, uh, who's six kids, not one of them is interested in wildlife. And Richard, my my good, my host, his boy Finbar is, is a skater dude. And so he's, he's not really massively into wildlife. And Rich says he's lamenting the fact. He's probably hearing that now as we speak. Um, I, don't, which is, I which think is, Zachary yeah. will, will remain a naturalist and a conservationist because he's got that passion from an early age. And you can't, once you, once you understand the language of, of the flowers that are around yeah. you, the plants that are around you, it like you with, with bird sounds that, that you know, we both learned when we were very small, you, it doesn't go away. You, you he's know, one of us. He's one of us, the poor child, the poor, poor dear child. Come on, we, we, I'm so, I mean, nature's, lockdown was really difficult for, for you, for me, for everyone, for different ways. But I mean, nature for me kind of got me through it, it saved me. It was, it's, it's, it's my natural antidepressant. I'm someone who's glass completely brimmeth over. I'm a natural optimist, I'm a natural enthusiast. But even I struggle at times, but I found solace in nature. It was beautiful. I mean, the birds kept singing. Uh, the wildflowers were still there. I mean, it got me, nature's calendar, and the rhythm of wildlife kind of got me through the, the toughest of years. I mean, it, it's, I saw a tweet of yours, Nick, when you said, I'm lying in bed, I've just heard a tawny owl, I've just heard a barn owl. I mean, we're richer for that, aren't we? Oh, enormously. I had an avocet fly past this very desk. This <laughs> and, and it was just well, the first avocet I've ever seen from my desk. And I was just so excited. Clute, clute. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Clute, clute. Um, so that was brilliant. To someone who's never, let's say someone who has a small garden, they've never, they've never had a strong relationship with a sense of place, a sense of... Um, living amongst wildlife what would you what would you advise people to do what would you what would you wish for people who are just beginning to love wildlife maybe adapt their own space for wildlife i think wildlife started watching wildlife for me started in my own back garden as a kid that's where i cut my teeth as a naturalist identifying the blue tits the robins the blackbirds a conservation starts in your own back garden and i wrote a book a long time ago about turning my own I mean, it's an eighth of an acre. It's about the size of a tennis court into my own personal nature reserve. And it was absolutely joyous seeing what came in. And it coincided a lot when I was kind of a young father as well. So I mean, I was, I was slightly confined to barracks. Um, and I've, you know, it, size doesn't matter with gardens. I mean, I've got one small garden, but it's a patchwork, it's, it's one patch in a massive patchwork quilt. Collectively, gardens are the biggest nature reserve in Britain. And gardens are amazing for wildlife because what, what wildlife likes is, is mosaics. I mean, so I've got a bit of woodland. I've got a, about five trees on a wooded bank. I've got a pond. I'm very lucky I've got a stream down the bottom. Yeah. I've got a tiny meadow, which is about the size of this. Uh, I've got herbaceous borders. I've got a little bit of scrub. So I've got this massive mosaic of habitats. So you don't need to do much to attract wildlife to your garden. I would say just add water, you know, sink a Belfast sink in the garden or bucket if you can't, if you've got the space, put a bit of water in, leave a rough corner, get some flowers in, think about nectar and pollen, right from the last frosts through to the first frosts. It's, you know, it's not rocket science making a garden attractive for wildlife. I mean, you know, put the flowers in, put the water in, and they will come and they just sit back and reap the dividends. 
I mean, I, I, I sat back and the, the signature bird in my garden is the bullfinch. And it comes in, I've seen four or five males together in the garden. I mean, and, and they, they, come into the, they come into the meadow and they, 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 they hover and they extract a, a dandelion seed from the clock. And they sit in my apple tree and they snip off the parachute and they crack the little seed like a tiny walnut. And it's just beautiful. And it's, it doesn't cost anything to sit and watch that. It's, it, it's just joyous. So, I mean, no matter what you've got, just sit back and enjoy it. I mean, that's, I, I don't know if I've asked, answered your question. To be you have indeed. And, and it really is, uh, it's an answer really to everything that people have been experiencing. We've, we've now moved into a different phase of the pandemic where everyone wants to be away from home and to get out and experience different things but during the, the especially those early months when when you and Zachary were on your early adventures yeah um, really we were valuing that tiny that that patch that that access to nature that we had and feeling incredibly privileged because we had it because so many people in the middle of cities didn't have that and the lockdown was so strict they didn't have the right to to, to the, get gardens, the garden saved us i mean imagine living in inner london in a one bedroom flat with with three kids uh, and then trying to do a job at home maybe being a single parent i don't they deserve a medal i don't know how they got through it because we were outside all the time it was like our our, our fourth bedroom and we just lived in the garden and just enjoyed the wildlife and played swing ball and got the paddling pool out I don't know how they did it. The garden saved us. It was, I can't emphasize it enough. It was, it's joyous. It's my, I, I often say my, my, when I bought it, it's worth a bit more now. I, I, I bought a, a quarter of a million pound house with a half a million pound garden. And my house is worth a little bit more now, but um, it's, it's, it's a million pound garden. It's amazing. I get onto the bottom and I've had otter in my garden. I know you've had Avocet past, flying past your <laughs> winter. I've actually sat there with Gary Moore, the sound recordist, and we sat doing the dawn chorus, and otter swam past, never saw us, swam past us. I have kingfisher flying around my garden frequently. They come up, they come up the steps, whiz around the pond, and then fly back to the garden. So, I mean, it, it, all that kind of stuff happens, uh, and it's just, it's just beautiful. Magic. Beautiful. magic. What magic. Back to plants. You've been herring around the country now 750 th plants into your thousand plant mm. challenge um what what have you learned about the flora of the british arts i've learned a lot of it I've yeah, learned... indeed but beyond identification what do you think the most important things you've learned have been um I, i've just I've, I've gone back to school um, for me, it's they're incredibly beautiful. They're incredibly challenging. Different challenges to, um, to to being a birder. I mean, there's there's can you identify it? Can you find it? I mean, there's learning so much. Uh, plants are amazing. I, I basically I was um, I came back from Scotland. I was doing some tour leading up at, uh, in Granton on Spey, where I spent a lot of my time. And I drove back, and I thought, what can I see on the way back? Double up. So I popped into a tiny reserve in Gloucestershire. And it's got this plant called limestone woundwort. Uh, and it only exists in two places in the entire British Isles. There's one site in Gloucestershire and a site in Mid Wales. What's going on there? How can it exist in two places? I mean, what's going on? How has it survived in those two places? I mean, this, this forgotten plant, and it was beautiful. It was like, it was like field woundwort, only not stinky, where the flower is much more beautiful and much more downy. And I found it kind of hidden under this kind of hedgerow. And you know what? The thing that amazes me about wildlife plants is no one's looking at them. I mean, flora is, no one's looking at plants. I've, I've been botanizing obsessively. I've been out for 100 days this year, and I've bumped into about five botanists in that time. I was, uh, yesterday, I was at Calston and Cheerhill Downs in Wiltshire. I was doing a piece for BBC Radio Wiltshire with my friend, my friend Ben Prater. And I said, come out with me, Ben, and I will do, we'll look at Wiltshire's finest chalk downland and we'll go and find round-headed rampion. Round-headed rampion. It's an amazing plant that's only found in the Wiltshire downlands. And we're in this amazing place. There's clustered bellflower there. There's, it, it's just an astonishing array of fabulous plants. Do you know what? There's not a single person looking at the flowers. There are people that are walking their dog there, enjoying them. I was like, what is wrong with 
these people. They're just, plants are so glorious. So, I mean, it's, it, the book is a love letter to plants and it's like, come on, please, people. Why are you not enjoying these plants? And on one hand, it's bittersweet. We've got this place to ourselves. The scudding clouds going overhead, these amazing chalk downlands, rolling countryside, beautiful flowers all around us. But I'm just full of sorrow that no one's enjoying them at the finest time of year. Uh, I mean, plants are just forgotten. I, I they are glorious. To the and, and they're almost like a portal into another into another layer of existence. Because as you say, most people aren't looking. They're not noticing. And just on my walk back from the gym the other day, I said 143 before. It was actually 145. <laughs> and they were all they were all like something that was just for me. You know, there's me going, oh, hello, hedge wound word. Oh, hello. Um, read canary grass hello read sweet grass hello uh, all these things that are just that they're there and they're enriching my day and they're giving me a sense of landscape because of course they tell you like like your your um limestone wound work, um, they tell you something about that place about its history about its um soils about its climate about what people have done in that place um and so they really are just a, a passport into a different reality they're fabulous you see a plant like common rock rose, Helianthemum numularia. What a beautiful name. Or Veronica beckabunga. Oh. I love Latin names. Like Helianthemum numularia, you see it and you want to go, I am in a quality place. I am in this quality place at a fantastic time of year. And so it's this kind of portal. It's a limestone grassland, um, uh, south facing, uh, beautiful, never been ploughed, never fertiliser thrown all over it, improved. What's all improved about? I mean, wrecked. Um, so it, 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 all of a sudden, it's, you're right, it's a portal. It's like one plant, you find one plant, uh, Adonis annua, pheasant's eye. I was with Richard today and he found this tiny, tiny little plant and he was jumping up and down with joy. And he said, what is it with this plant? It just wants to die. <laughs> And they just, just took, took us to this portal of this amazing habitat, which is of a bygone era. These, these kind of wildlife, I mean, corn cockle, agrostemma. I mean, gee, bloody hell, what a plant. With these massive, beautiful sepals that stick out beyond the petals. It's just like, look at me, look at me. I'm so bloody beautiful, look at me. And everyone's just wandering past it, ignoring it. And um, I, 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 was, I was in the... Uh, ben Prater left me yesterday when I was on the Carlson Cheerhill Downs and I was looking at this Hypericum, this St John's word. I was thinking, is that Hypericum perforatum? Which you, it's amazing, you take a leaf and you hold it up and it's got all these little dots and it's got these little black dots around the edge. I was thinking it's a Hypericum perforatum and I was thinking, no one's looking, no one's ignoring this. Um, and this lady walked past with her dog and her husband. She, she looked across at me and went, I think it's perforatum. <laughs> I was like, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it was just, I want to say, and this is your wife, but I love you. It was amazing. I said, yeah, it's a fact. It's the fourth time I've met somebody who's into plants. It was just a beautiful moment. Why are there more people like us, Nick? I, I, I don't think the world could take that many of us, Mike. I don't know. No, and there would be more people like us no. into clothes. Oh. Oh, that there were. But to jump back actually to what you said about pheasant sigh and what your friend Richard said about pheasant sigh and it being a plant that wants to die. But in a sense, the plant in, in many other in many parts of its range in the Mediterranean, for example, it's doing yeah. very nicely. And it's yeah. doing very nicely because it hasn't had the monstrous insults to the landscape that we've yeah. that we've wreaked on our landscape here in the UK. And um, we've done for arable weeds for want of a better word altogether but with our with our herbicides with our changes in when we plow with our uh, in many senses it's um it's not it's not a question of the plant wanting to die it's just that we're doing everything in our power to enable it yeah i mean it's, it's, it's almost going back in time to a kind of victorian halcyon era and richard said that these he said this, this field has been laid out as this field. I've got maps 350 years ago. And it's hard to think of a landscape that has changed less than these amazing agricultural, these old farm reserves that have been managed sympathetically. I just love the underdog. I like weeds coming up through the pavement. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fail quest. 
Arabidopsis thaliana. I mean, what an amazing plant. I mean, it's just kind of hanging in there, gnarly, just like sticking up there. And the great thing about now is because uh, no mo may and, and they don't want to, local councils don't want to spray and they're, 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 it's not coming around with their knapsack sprayers. I mean, these, these gorgeous urban weeds are all over the place. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just joyous at the moment. But you're right, we live. I mean, Britain is one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. If you want to go to a arable nature reserve, there's about three in the country. I mean, one, of them, one of them I hasten to add, Norfolk Wildlife Trust, Weeting Heath. Oh, Weeting um, Heath, I, I was there recently. Yeah, so you were looking for Fingered Speedwell and Spring Speedwell and Breckland Speedwell um, in, our arable weeds, in our arable weeds reserve. Plus, there are many other beautiful things, uh, including some of the rare poppies that you mentioned. Um, Volicus Picata. Uh, indeed. Um, so that's one of the, as you say, there are hardly any. And that since 1970, we have grown the same old strain of rye on that reserve. Well, it's the neighboring farmer who does it for us, but uh, in order to maintain those arable weeds, and in some cases, it's the only field in the country where those species grow. I mean, it's just bonkers. I saw interrupted brome, bromus interruptus today. It's the rarest grass in Britain. And it's like a funny little soft brome with a kind of gap between the bottom spikers and the top spikers. They call it interrupted, it's got a gap there. And it was reintroduced from the QC bank. And it was reintroduced, they thought it was extinct. And they had this conversation uh, and some guy said, I've got some in a plant pot at home. <laughs> and it was, it was recovered from that one plant pot and it's been spread around a number of sites. And I saw Bronus Interruptus, I got down on my hands and knees and I was just like, homage to this amazing plant. It was just a plant that just doesn't fit in the, in the 20th century. It was astonishing, 21st but that's century. Why, but that's why we need your passion communicating to people about the importance of these things. And it's why we need the work of Norfolk Wildlife Trust and all of our partners in conservation who are preserving the space for these things. You need, if anyone's, um, oh, Mike, you want to- To give a shout out for the Wildlife Trust, a lot of the best plant reserves are managed by the Wildlife Trust because they're small sites like the Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust, the place that had limestone wound wort. The best botanical sites in Britain are managed by the county trusts because the RSPB, or they're not the birds there, um, the National Trust, there's no big house on it. Um, so a uh, big shout out to the Wildlife Trust because they manage these wonderful sites. And actually they're, they're quite expensive to look after some of these sites because they require a lot of management and no buggers going to see them, apart from me, uh, to see limestone wound work. So, I mean, it, the, a big shout out to the Wildlife Trust, managing sites and uh, the species that are kind of under-recorded, under-loved, but should be conserved. Well, I'm going to follow that up with a, a double punch for our um, the opportunity if people wish to to make a donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust because, of course, during the pandemic we've lost membership, we've struggled yeah. to we've had staff coming on into work and going away from work and being furloughed and backwards and forwards and so it's been it's been very very difficult. And just today I had the privilege of proofreading the annual report, which covers some of the a lot of the great successes, but also some of the tricky things that have come out of the last year. Now. Michael, we have a question. Harriet Thomas has asked, uh, we may have different opinions on this, but she's asking yeah. you, could you recommend, we have different opinions on so many things, um, could you recommend the best guidebook on wildflowers for an interested but beginner botanist? Uh, my favourite book is impossible to get hold of. It's the Domino Guides. It's, it's, um, it's by Blamey, Fitter and oh, Fitter. Yeah. It's the second edition. Uh, it's going, uh, and it's, it's, I can't get on with Stace. It's too technical. Stace is the Bible, no pictures. I'm the numpty, I need to see the pictures. Uh, that is really, really good. It's flipping impossible to get a hold of one. Uh, if, you, if, if you want to go into entry, um, uh, Simon Harrop's Harrop's Wildflowers is brilliant. It doesn't have all the rarities. And I know Simon, he's an awful boy. He I is. Was, I was interviewing him for a Radio 4 piece I'm doing on wildflowers for, um, in the Brex just recently. And Simon's an astonishing botanist. His pictures are brilliant. Uh, that's my second go-to book. I use the Domino Guides book and I also use Harrop's Wildflowers. So that is a really, really good book. 
The Collins one is a belter and massive, but it, that's got grasses and sedges and rushes and ferns in. So I would go with Simon's if you're a beginner, uh, and maybe a, an, another book just to show the to show pictures of them or, or, or portraits of them as well. I would... Simon's is very very good, and if you can get a hold of, you can get the first edition of the Blamey Fitter and Fitter, and there's Blamey Fitter and Fitter, and there's a Fitter Blamey and Blamey, and a Blamey Fitter and Blamey, and all that stuff. But the Domino Guide is the one I use, and I've got this weird shoulder holster. It's like I've got a, a magnum gun in there and I pull it out. I've got my eye lens and I'm set. That's all I need. It's so cheap botanizing. Don't need a pair yes. of bins. Yes. I hope you've got, having lived in Ecuador, I hope you've got an Andean um, textile shoulder holster. Do you notice this is an Awayu from Bolivia? I was thinking was it, this is a, an Awayu. So this is a, a lady's um, for carrying her baby, which, oh. which was given to me by the, the lady who carried her baby in this very, in this very Awayu from... Um, uh, you to to <laughs> um, I like let's your blankets. Let's return to English. So I would um, agree with, um, with Mike that um, Simon Harrop's photographic guide, normally I'm a bit wary of photographic guides, but yeah. as, as Mike says, the, uh, the photographs are absolutely brilliant and it's arranged in a really user-friendly, accessible way. Plus, um, plus, plus um, Simon is a great friend and supporter of Norfolk Wildlife Trust and we're very grateful to him. And perhaps David, who is our producer working from uh, Norwich, he could pop the link to Wild Sounds and Books because of course, um, we're very friendly with Wild Sounds and Books. You too, Mike, are very friendly with Duncan and all the lovely folks I love Wild that. Sounds. And they're great supporters of Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And if you make a purchase of Simon's book, um, you are also supporting conservation because for every purchase of a book from Wild Sounds and Books, money is given to conservation. So we both agree that the Simon Harrop Wildflower Guide would be a very, very good place to start. Now, in your chasing round, looking for extremely rare plants and common plants and the joy of plants, have you found yourselves in any sort of bother? Uh, yeah, I was almost beaten up looking at Coltsfoot. Yes, um, and because I basically, I, I wanted to go to brownfield sites and I found brownfield sites were basically out of bounds mm. because they've all got them all chain linked up and don't 24 hour surveillance, do not come in here, all that kind of stuff. And I found this one with the gates open and there's some cars in there and I wandered in and I found Coltsville straight away and this bloke with a filthy mm. high-vis jacket came up saying like, what are you doing here? I was like, looking at the wildflowers, the weeds. He goes, you can't get out. I said, why can't I get out? It's not doing any harm. I'm just photographing them. And I said, I'd like to speak to your boss, please. And I thought, by saying that, I'll give myself time to photograph the colt's foot, and then he'll come down and say, sling your hook. And this bloke came down, he was like a wardrobe, and he was visibly shaking with anger. And I thought he was gonna beat me up. Um, so bottom line was, they kind of drummed me out of the site. But the only other time I've been in a spot of bother was, I went to an amazing place called Stanner Rocks. Do you know Stanner Rocks? No, I don't right on the Welsh border. And it was just as lockdown was emerging. It was slightly dodgy me going there. Only dodgy because I kind of, mm, I had to have a letter to go there, but I was actually filming for the gadget show um, about all about wildlife gizmos. And I had to do a slight detour to get there. So if anyone stopped me, say, what are you doing? I said, I've got a letter saying I'm allowed to go filming with the gadget show. And they were like, you're slightly, slightly off the beaten track. But I went there anyway and thought I can bluff it out if I get caught. And I went, Stanner Rocks has um, Gagia um, Bohemica, early star of Bethlehem. And it's the only site in Britain that has it. Um, and Peter Maron, who's a very well-known bloke, tried to write a book about, well, wrote a book, so trying to see the last 50 wildflowers. That he, I mean, he's an amazing botanist. Uh, and Gagia Bohemica was the first one he went for. And he got the guide who knows the site really well to take him up there. And I read Peter Maron's book and thought, I'm gonna try and see it on my own. Um, and I heard it was down the bottom and I got myself onto this cliff face and I was slightly like this. And I thought, if I fall here, I'm gonna die. Uh, and I actually, <laughs> I found one flower, one slightly deformed crinkle, because they often come out slightly deformed, the petals on Gagia Bohemica. And I found it and I was like, Peter Marin needed a guide. I almost killed myself and I found Gagia Bohemica on my own. And I, I'm not, 
I, 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 I constantly kind of question myself, like, am I a naturally good botanist? And I'm not very good at finding things. But what I have is I am so bloody minded. I will stay there for eight hours until I find a plant. And I will just drive myself insane. I'll be effing and jeffing and angry with myself until I find the plant. I did that recently, small white orchid up in Scotland. They gave me the grid reference and I couldn't find it. And I was stomping up and down past the bog asphodel till the car, but I just stuck at it for an hour and a half until I found it. <laughs> what I have in my, in my arsenal is sheer bloody mindedness. So I'm not, eventually I found it and I was just totally thrilled. But most of the time it's like, oh, there you are. I must uh, point out at this point, it's far less rare than Gagea Babylonica, um, but um, we have the only site in Norfolk for Gagea lutea, the yellow star. Oh, of I've only seen the leaves of that this year. It's ah, so yeah, hard but, to find in the West Country. Uh, yeah, well, we have the only site in Norfolk, which is our fantastic Wayland Wood Reserve, um, which is in the Brex, not far away from Thompson Common. And it grows in just one small, well, it's easy to see in just one small patch of the wood, but you've got to know exactly where to go to. It's a very shy flower as well. It is, yeah, it's a very subtle little thing, beautiful, beautiful little thing. But we're very privileged to have owned that wood now for several decades and to, to love it dearly. And it's full of all sorts of other botanical wonders. So you were saying off to Scotland next. That's your next yes. step in the botanical mission. I, I'm, I'm, I'm climbing, um, I'm going for an astonishing plant. Um, I pitched an idea to Radio 4, uh, they have a strand called Costing the Earth. Uh, and I've spent a lot of time up in Scotland. At the, uh, I work at a talk called the Grand Times Hotel where they do these celebrity guided holidays. Well, I'm supposedly a celebrity. I feel very uncomfortable with that C word. But anyway, um, if you want to come and pay me to go and share them wildlife, I will. Um, and I love Arctic alpines. I love weeds and I love plants that are hanging on um, uh, in these kind of tiny kind of Arctic northern outposts. And um, I, I read this book um, by Michael Scott talking about Arctic alpine plants, kind of like, I mean, they're the ones right at the front of climate change. I mean, we, we think we're, we're badly off with COVID, but I mean, climate change is the big elephant in the room. It's the, it's the big rumbling uh, concrete ball, ball that's coming towards us, Harrison Ford's um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it's going to hit us right slap bang in the face fairly soon. Um, and the Arctic Alpine plants are maybe the first ones that are going to disappear. Because, I mean, if you're on at a thousand metres on the north side of a quarry, there's nowhere for you to go if the climate continues to get warmer. But they can probably hang in there, but all the other plants are creeping up and they're being... They survive there because they can cope with those tough, gnarly conditions, but they're really, really poor competitors. So we're going to lose all these Arctic alpine plants. So I pitched this idea about, are we going to, is our floor going to change the climate change? We're going to get more continental plants. Is it going to get more like the Breckland? Are we going to get lots more fingered speedwell? And then we're going to lose things like Snowden Lily and all the saxifrages. And I had this plant in mind, and Simon Harrop tipped me off about this plant called Norwegian Mugwort that only survives on two mountain tops in, 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 um, in uh, Westerwas, north of Ullapool. And I think I have to sit, go and see, um, I have to go and see Norwegian Mugwort. And it's on this incredibly remote mountain called Kolmor, which is where I've given myself three days to climb it. And I'm going up with an amazing lady called Dr. Barbara Jones who used to work for Countryside Council for Wales, and she's looked after all the Arctic alpines in Snowdonia. And she's going to be my guide as we climb this mountain, looking, at, looking for Norwegian mugwort. So I, I get back on Monday, and then I drive up on Tuesday, and then we go and look for Nor Norwegian mugwort next week. And hopefully you'll hear it on Radio 4 in September, I think. How so I'm looking for Norwegian mugwort. How Artemisia norvegica. <laughs> How very exciting. And we, of course, in the Brex have our own Breckland mugwort, which is a very rare plant, but benefiting from being- Artemisia campestri. Benefiting from, ticked off this year, very good. Benefiting from programs to reintroduce it to sites where it was known in the past. Now, Mike, I'm very aware that you, have, are... you so have you seen it, Nick? Have you I seen think... Artemisia campestri? I have indeed, yes, I have indeed. Because yeah. amazingly, it's hardly in the reserve, it's in the gutters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So many of the Breck specialities, and indeed, I mean, we have, we uh, across Norfolk, we have lots of roadside nature reserves because, yeah. for example, down in the Claylands in the south of Norfolk, sulphur clover, which is nationally a very rare plant, 
plant. Um, you've got that as well. No. no, that grows mostly in road verges. And so we've got strips of road verges that are nature reserves specially for it. Now, Mike, I'm very aware that um, we're trespassing on your time with your friend Richard, but also his computer and his internet. And doubtless Finbar has got stories to tell you about his, um, his skateboarding. Um, got good his, memory. His, Oh yeah, wow, never, never, especially with you, you're dangerous. I have to remember everything you say. I might need to use it against you. Um, we wish you the very, very best of luck with, um, with your plant book. And we are extremely great. And indeed all the adventures that are going to carry on and, um, and end up in the book. And we're extremely grateful to you for having joined us this evening. Um, have a brilliant time looking for Norwegian mugwort. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you to Dave as well for arranging this. Um, I love coming to Norfolk and I'm going to come over and I'm going to talk to you about South America. We're going to speak Spanish all night long and we can talk about people and about wildlife and about places and we'll just have a beautiful evening. Uh, I mean, and, and both me and Nick actually talk for wildlife worldwide, so we are the go-to resident biologists. I do the Somerset levels and um, the Highlands of Scotland and then you do everything in between. So, I mean, we, we, we kind of, we, our paths cross all the time. So I'm looking forward to having a pint with you and David when we can do it without social distancing. You're always welcome in Norfolk and Norfolk Wildlife Trust looks forward to hosting you again, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, David. And love to everyone in Norfolk. You, as I say, Norfolk enchants. That's absolutely true. Thank you to everybody who's been here with us this evening. Have a lovely evening. Get out there, enjoy some wildflowers in the spirit of Mr. Dilger, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.